Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody from the uh, Global South and North. Today, we are dealing with a webinar on decolonizing aid. And here, I hand over to Mr. Akane for the question and answer. Thank you very much, and good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, I really enjoyed the presentations from the panelists, and I, I believe everyone uh, also enjoyed the presentations. And the last speaker, uh, Mr. Martins, you spoke very well. Thank you for putting us through uh, all that. Uh, and uh, and uh, basically, the, the webinar uh, is all about we coming up with a new language about uh, age. It shouldn't be, uh, we, don't, we, we don't really uh, want to hear that word, or we don't really like that word that we call age. Because it's, it's another way of uh, uh, colonialism in Africa again, and mostly in Nigeria. I mean Nigeria because I'm in Nigeria because I'm from Nigeria, and we know so far so well we are still depending on it. So it's another way of being a slave to the global South. So changing that language is very important, and also changing other languages like Martin said. Change the language calling people poor shouldn't be poor. There should be a language that is a kind of that is pleasant to people. There should be that equality. There should not be inequality. So 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 far so well. The uh, panelists have presented their, their their topics and they've dealt more on it. Now it's time for questions and uh, and answers. Please, if you have a question, you can show by lift of hand and uh, you go straight to your question and. We, we give you the floor, you go straight to your, your questions and our uh, panelists, they are online and they'll be able to attend to your questions. Please, let's just use the next how many minutes and ask our questions and also give our contributions before we call it a day. Thank you, everybody. Please, is there anyone that has a question? We are just, we are still talking. I remember Professor Anna talking about, he talked about, uh, Professor Anna talked about uh, uh, disparity in healthcare delivery. And the uh, ambassador talked about do not deciding uh, things for the recipient. So those are the things. So we have Professor Anna, before we come to ambassador question. Professor Anna, please unmute yourself and ask your question, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, I want to uh, thank everyone who is here, especially those who were given the opportunities to, to present like myself. I want to particularly also thank uh, uh, Martin Drury um, for very thought provoking um, comments that he gave to us. And my question is to him, how do you think that, you know, the WPA and Kampala Initiative and NUCAN can work together to advance the, um, uh, the change in language mm. from aid to solidarity. Mm. Thank you. Do you want me to answer? Okay. Or? Yeah, Ma yeah Martins, you have to answer that before we now go to the next question. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, and thanks, Joseph. I just saw your that same question in the chat. And I was just typing a reply. Uh, I, I think um, it would be good maybe also for us to take this offline and continue to talk about it. Because I think it's, it's. Uh, uh, I, I think first of all, we need, and Hami will, will be able to, uh, uh, to facilitate it, but it would be good. You know, I'd, I'd also love to be personally involved. I, th I think, um, because I think, what it will to change a narrative is going to require uh, some not just good ideas it's going to require some sustained organization and I, I i what i feel is that we could collaborate in um a, a couple of ways so so one is um for an organization like health poverty action whose head office is in the uk we're decentralized but the head office is there then um 
we can see that it seems to us that uh, a, a new language is needed and a new narrative is needed. It seems to us that framing it around uh, tackling inequality of power and of wealth is helpful. But, um, you, you know, the whole point is that um, these things should be led by the, the greatest stakeholders, not, not by us. So, uh, you know, we, our opinion shouldn't carry authority. You know, yours should carry more. It's a, it's a partnership, it's a dialogue, but you know, yours should carry more. So I think one thing is to um, uh, come up with, you know, the new language is much more powerful and much more appropriate if it's come from the global south rather than the likes of me saying, I think this is a good idea. So I think one is to co-create, to work with and show leadership in, in devising the new language. And then I think the other one is to um, work with his organization uh, in a very organized way to, uh, to get others to take it up. Because, you know, those of us in this webinar don't have big budgets. You know, the huge, the big NGOs and the, the DFIDs and the, and the political parties, they do. And if they keep using the aid language, you know, that is the main one that most of the people will hear. But I think there is potential, as I say, with the Labour Party, with the opposition parties, to get a new um, uh, uh, language taken up. I think it might be that what we want to do is look at it at two levels. So amongst ourselves, we might want to think what our ideal language would be, and that might be around reparation, for example, you know, and calling the aid budget repar rep uh, reparation. But and that's good, you know, I think it, and it, 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 it should be. But I think also the, rep, you, the language of reparation would be very hard to win politically in terms of getting it adopted by the political parties. So it might be that we also want, whereas I think tackling inequality might be winnable. So it might be that we have different levels of language. So whether we need a strategy. Sorry, I spoke too long. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Prova, are you okay? Do you have any other question? Yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, someone just dropped a question here. Right. Yeah, then I'm going to read the question. Yeah, there's the, the question offline. Uh, uh, Natalie, Natalie asked a question. Her question is uh, okay, to the panelists who wishes to answer. To answer. Yeah, what do you think? Do not governments need to do to address their role in the various challenges described that they don't know government what do you think they can do to tackle the challenges that we've identified in the in maybe in the disbursement of the of the earth that is given to uh, our country so uh, is there anyone that wants to answer before we now go to uh, madam lady's question Yeah, I would like to say something. Uh, I can hear you. Can I attend you? I can please, say something. Ambassador, please, can you handle that one? Ambassador. Yeah, who wants okay. to answer? Yeah, yeah, I want to answer that. I have already okay. mentioned one, one, in, one, one area where I said, um, I don't know whether Mr. Matthews will agree with that. The, there's the issue of debt, debt forgiveness. There's the issue of what is currently happening. Uh, the refugees going into Europe, um, taking the risk over the Mediterranean, and, uh, and so many things. I know the Europe, Europe doesn't want so many people to come to come to come to that side. And uh, I think the governments, the European countries, particularly the developed nations, uh, I know they are contributing a lot of. Uh, development is to, uh, to Africa and Nigeria. But then uh, I think it will be mutually beneficial for both sides to, to assist aid receiving countries to develop themselves. And it's not the development, the, the type of development that, that is in micro scale, as I'm saying, because you don't develop a country by giving them humanitarian aid alone. You have to make them to be to have the infrastructure. For example, take the case of Nigeria. Everything is costly. Transporting things from the from the port to the hinterland is very costly. We build the roads. The, the vehicles are overloaded. Two, three years, the roads collapse. 
the railway is not working. And the Chinese are giving loans at a very uh, exorbitant rate. Corruption is, is hurting it. Not, not much of Nigeria is having railway. So electricity, you know, all, all this, once they are able to assist uh, aid civil countries to have productive infrastructure that will make the economy to work, then people will not have any incentive to, to travel uh, across the, the, the Mediterranean. Many of them get down. It's not it's not healthy for them. It's not good for the for the for the, mm -hmm. for the so it, it is it is a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. They should not stop at only providing uh, aid for humanitarian uh, and uh, and the the smaller scale um, interventions that that uh, continue to support humanitarian uh, interventions that may come. But then actual actual um, infrastructure development that will help the economy that will make the, the other alternatives for, for transportation power supply to work very well so that um, people will no longer find going to Europe any more uh, attraction. So that, that is my, that is my take. That's why I want to hear. Okay, uh, thank you, Ambassador. And uh, Natalia, uh, Natalie, if you have any other question, please just type it since you, your mic is not kind of functioning. Now let's go to the next question, uh, Prof. Adenige. Please unmute yourself and ask a question. I, I know, I know. Let, 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 let's hear from Prof. Please. We'll come to you. Hello, Prof. Hello, Prof. Adenige. Okay, uh, Madam Lizzie, please let's go to your question. <coughs> Thank you very much. And uh, my question is still to Mr. Martins. In this time that we know that the issue in aid in, mm -hmm. in developing countries mm -hmm. is because there's much power and concentration in the hand of the government. And mm -hmm. less money is given to monitoring and, and evaluation. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the NGOs and CSOs, especially those like us, like no can like uh, Nigerian women farmers that work in the, in the communities find it uh, difficult to get funding. So how can we impact on making ar arguments when policies are ongoing in the formulation? How can we come out? How can the communities be aware of of a policy that the government is bringing up that cannot even impact on them? How can they react? This goes to ask how can we, how can the NGOs be funded to bridge the gap between the government and the un, and the ungoverned and the communities that need this aid? Thank you very much. Mm. Would you like me to respond? Okay, Martins, up to yeah. you. Okay, thank you. Um, really good question, uh, Lizzie. I I would suggest two things as priority. I think, so one thing comes back to um, what I said before about reframing our work as being about I think, inequality of, in all forms, particularly I think inequality of power. I think poverty in its ultimately is actually more about lack of power than it's about lack of money. You know, if you've got power, you're not going to be poor. So I, I think I think ultimately it's more about lack of power. So I think that in all kinds of uh, programs, addressing that inequality of power should be, you know, one of the main criteria. It's part of everything. The the other thing I think is um, a campaign to donors. So those can be. Uh, trusts and foundations, there can be even corporations, there can be uh, INGOs, and especially the government donors, the UN agencies, the, the government. But I think they need a much more sophisticated tool about identify, to identify the best organizations to receive funding. So at the moment, they, they often talk about using civil society rather than government, and that has advantages and disadvantages. You know, ultimately, it's important to strengthen the public services. You know, they, that, that's important. 
and setting up parallel systems, we don't want to be doing that. So ultimately, it's important to strengthen public services. And uh, I think, uh, you know, as speakers before me have said, it's important to uh, uh, build up the tax gathering capacity in country so that the public services can be uh, funded from the country's own resources. But I, I think, um, uh, you know, but sometimes, yes, uh, donors want to, uh, to fund not through the government, through the civil society for various reasons. But I, I think there, which civil society, and I think there's a lot of talk about localization. And, uh, but I think localization isn't, isn't to just look at funding a local organization rather than one that's rooted at, uh, more internationally or nationally isn't enough because a local organization can very can often reinforce local power dynamics. So we come across that quite often with indigenous uh, communities. An organization can be can be local, but it's the local um, it's run by the local power holders and, and the more marginalized ethnic groups don't get a say. So I think donors need to have a, uh, I think they need a power analysis tool or some kind of metric to look at where the leadership is really coming from in the, you know, the preparation of the proposal, the plans and the monitoring and evaluation. So you're saying about monitoring and evaluation, who judges whether or not it's been effective? You know, and that should be the people whose lives it's about. Oh, okay. Oh, well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Martin. Uh, we do, we still have to call uh, on Prof. Prof. Denige, please, if you are... If yeah, you are her on, audio, on. she dropped the line. Her audio is not working. Not functioning. Okay, please, you can type your question and, and put it on the platform. We'll see how to answer the question. Now, let's go to Madam uh, Fam Bisi. Fam Bisi is, uh, is up. Fam Bisi, please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, I did not have a question. I wanted to make a contribution okay, 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 to that question. Okay, I wanted to make a contribution to the question on how donors can fund the, um, the CSA. Um, I think there's something called the last mile uh, logistics. I was just about to, to actually uh, type that in. What you call the last mile logistics is just uh, what it takes to get to the, the farthest, um, the, the most distal stakeholder. That is, the, it, it could be the poorest, it could be the physically distal person or the poorest person or whatever. So that's what you call your last mile tactic and your last mile strategy. And I believe very much that if the donor um, really wants to, implement aid properly, then they should introduce last mile logistics into donor funding, where uh, the person at the receiver end, the last person at the receiver end, that is the last, the, the most important key stakeholder at the receiver end, at the end where that project is being implemented, is involved. Last mile logistics. And uh, when you talk of donor funding, there are many things that um, people need to, many requisite conditions. So that should be one of the conditions. That is the last mile stakeholder to be involved. To be involved. That is just my suggestion. Because it is too, the, 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 the donor is too far up there to see that person. But if you're talking of last mile logistics, it's a lot of uh, stakeholders that is involved. It would now involve the community leader and then the community itself and so on. And uh, that is where um, a lot is amiss because the community leaders um, do not necessarily um, engage their own community. So if the, if the CSO is working with the community leader, if the CSO cannot run that program with the community leader, but in the community. So the, I think those are the, a, a little bit of extra research like uh, Martin said, like Martin Drew said, a little more research and, and going an extra mile to reach the last mile before giving that grant or that or do not want. And then when the reporting is also being done, 
that extra mile. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Th thank. Okay. Thank you, ma. Please, do we have any other question or? Yes, yes. I have. My hand has gone up. Okay, okay. Ambassador, ambassador. Yes, ambassador. Can you hear me? Yes, bro. I'm coming back to you. Yes, please. 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 Yes, please in the manner that I want to discuss this issue. Uh, we know there is a lot of corruption. In the yes, are you, are you hearing me? There's so much corruption. Yeah, yeah. So much money is stolen out of Nigeria, for example. Um, in the late 90s, the military gym stole a lot of money. We are, we are familiar with the Abacha loot. We are familiar with other loots all over. Recently, some monies were recovered uh, sent back from 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 the United States, some from Sweden, some from I think the UK, and what we hear happening is that the country from where the money is going to be transferred back to Nigeria will be dictating to Nigeria that this is how you are going to spend the money. For example, if Nigeria wants to spend the money in infrastructure, they will force Nigeria to do social intervention. I don't know where this, this, this happened. This is our money that was stolen out and maybe given, given sanctuary in banks in the, development, in the developed country. In the first instance, this such money should not have been taken out of Nigeria through active collaboration or countenancing by, by the developed countries. So what they can do, one, they should, they should arrest these people or seize the money and then supervise how these projects are going to be done. I don't see how, um, the, uh, because you are doing us a favor to return the money that was stolen, then you now dictate to us what happened. I remember when monies were transferred from France, the, the French government said that the, the Nigerian government must buy uh, Pojo, Pojo 2203 for the security forces. This was part of my presentation. I removed it, but it's coming now. What can they do? They should discourage a flight of capital through illicit um, uh, outflows uh, from Nigeria. I don't think that is difficult to do, you know? And then we know, for example, um, we, we hear that the, the, the relationship between French, the, the French as a nation, France as a nation, and its former colonies, the conditions that were set for colonies to be, to be given independence. They call it, a, they call it a something, is it a, uh, uh, there was a new, 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 new MOU that was signed that these colonies will have to be repatriating their money, uh, all their export uh, money to, to France, and uh, they, they cannot take more than 25 percent of such money. This is what is in the literature and in the internet. You read through it, you see. Then uh, you don't expect Africa to, 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 uh, to, to grow, to develop. You are impoverishing Africa, and then when the money is going to be uh, taken, you can't take more than 25 percent. And even that you are going to charge, France is charging them at, uh, some interest rate. So it is so, it's, it's not, an, it's not a, a palatable uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 agreement. We know, the, we know how Guinea Conakry resisted it and how, how France destroyed all the infrastructure in that particular. So colonialism should not be allowed to, to, to continue in perpetuity. Um, one one uh, one Caribbean uh, minister, I think, was addressing the the climate conference, and she she spoke her mind about about how she thinks that one third of the globe should not be in in in, uh, in, uh, in you know having having all the affluence, uh, but they are polluting the whole of the globe, and two thirds are, are suffering. This world belongs to all of us, and if we are to mismanage our own resources, it is going to affect them. So there is a common humanity. So uh, we, the the developed nations, I think, have to live up to their responsibility. They have they they they, they got a lot of resources from Africa and elsewhere. The the development in those countries are as a result of outflow of money and other resources to to those countries. Nobody was complaining, but then I I think it is now high time that there is some equity that that should be allowed to play. 
so that gradually we will also come up so that we don't become a problem to everybody. So that is my, my, my question. Oh, okay, thank you, Ambassador. I, I think that we have an adage that does say either detects uh, the pipe or either detects the, either the paste, the pipe part, something like that, detects the tune. And uh, being that Africa or the global south or the global north, we are, they know that we are depending on this edge. They seem to be exploiting us the more. So the global north, they, I, I mean, we should, we should be able to rise up and see how we can do less I mean, be less dependent on it. It will, it will kind of give us more power, more voice. I mean, voices when it comes to global, global issue. And again, when it comes to global issue, like the area that we are talking about, uh, when they know that that one's giving, they detect what we ought to do with the money. Like Ambassador just said, uh, it is it's no longer funny. There should be a parity whereby everyone, whatever you want to do with it, even if it is for, for the global South countries to also have a part to play, maybe there should be a coffer where, where all the countries uh, contribute money for aid around the globe. Everybody should be equal on that table, making decisions on that table. Who are the ones making decisions when, when, when it comes to aid? Who are the ones detecting the things? Who are the ones coming up with policies? So it still, it still boils down to the issue that we are talking about that we are still kind of uh, being deprived of so many things and we are still kind of being colonized in one way or the other. So we now leave for, we now give uh, Prof. Uh, Anna a chance to also ask this question or make his contribution before we go to Aminu. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rakan. Um, it's a contribution. Um, to okay. the issue of uh, the, the question about what um, donor countries should do. And <laughs> I take the view, frankly, that a lot of uh, the responsibility lies with us, the recipients of donors, to use whatever is coming properly. In the 1995, I think it was, uh, if you remember those who are Nigerians amongst in this, in this uh, platform, would remember when um, Mosop, Mosop leaders were, were killed by, um, during the Bashar regime, the, there was a global outcry uh, beginning from the Commonwealth because the Commonwealth heads of states were meeting in London at the time when this happened. And then, and it took a, there was a policy, an umbrella policy for all donor partners to stop dealing with the Nigerian government and deal rather deal with um, the NGOs and CSOs and you know the non-governmental actors in the field of um, uh, donors and aid and so on. Now that changed after 1999 when Nigeria. Uh, became democratic again. So now in the field, those um, donor partners, uh, donor governments would deal with government rather than dealing directly with CSOs and NGOs and non-government actors. But every single challenge that every speaker has enumerated during this last two hours, the donor governments and donor partners know about. So one of the things I think that they, they need to do is because for humanity's sake, they can talk, they don't, uh, they can't abandon countries, especially the poor ones and the vulnerable ones in countries, because they keep they have to give um, support and give aid. Fine. But can they bring in frameworks? Can they bring in things that ensures that you get aid today before you get the next one? You have to be able to demonstrate what you've done with the first one you collected. It is within their power to do that. They can do it. They can do it. They did it before. They can still do it. And that will check, reduce drastically the level of corruption that you and I noticed in the, in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the 
development world today in, in Nigeria and other countries, but it's not particularly unique to Nigeria. All the lower, low and middle income countries are suffering the same fate. That's one. So I think they need to hold governments to account before they give further loan, for further aid. Secondly, every speaker here has mentioned the importance of community engagement, community advocacy, community participation. The donor partners or the donor governments can also insist that for every aid or loan that they give, that the, you must show evidence that the community is a major stakeholder in practice, in the field. These two things, I believe, will make aid more meaningful, will make a lot of impact, and will begin to see results very, very quickly. Check the governments, since you don't want to deal directly with the NGOs and so non-government actors. OK, deal with the government, but hold them to account. If money for immunization goes missing, why do you keep pumping money into it now? You get the governments to account and then get the community at the very bottom end, those who are supposed to benefit from this aid to become stakeholders on it. Those are the two things I believe the donor governments can do. And it is within their power to do it. They can do it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, that's a nice contribution. We now go back to Prof. Okay, we now go to Aminu before Prof. Uh, Denige uh, make a contribution again. So Aminu, please unmute yourself and okay, Aminu, go ahead. No, I'm just uh, making also a contribution, not necessarily okay. a question. I think the presentations have been crystal clear, but from what has so far come to and also to echo what the professor has been saying, I think for me and I, I think we have about three levels, two levels at most, at which we need to do things differently. The first one is to do an introspective on us as Africans. I think it's very important to know what we can do as Africans to get ourselves in, in the trap that we find that we, we, we are in. So we need to see very many collectives being done at all levels. So the free trade area, for example, that is being advanced by the African Union, some of those initiatives that are going to enable us to develop, uh, to trade together and create wealth together are very, very critical in, in helping us escape the trap that we are in. But again, uh, that may not be enough because the traps are beyond us. Some of these traps are external. Some of them stretch back to colonialism to history, okay? The legacies are still with us. They're still running with us. And that's how the aid concept comes in. That's why someone who feels they're kind enough, okay? They can help us get ourselves out of the situation we're in so they can give us those handouts. I think that's when the concept in. And, and, and I think for me, that's where the narrative needs to change because the ones who are giving us these handouts are even responsible to some of the colonial uh, legacies that we are in. So they have accountability issues to handle with us. But for us to have those accountability issues and conversations along those lines, I think we need to have the narrative right. And I think that's where uh, this conversation has been coming in. As long as we call it aid, it's gonna be charity all the time. It's gonna, we're going to, to be, you know, subjected to the goodwill of some other people somewhere else. But as if we can change that to, let's say, a more dramatic word like reparation, which of course is debatable, mm. then it becomes easy. We start to demand, to ask for accountability for some of the things that went wrong historically. In Kenya here, for example, we still have land rights issues. Most of the land that was messed up during the, the occupation of, of East Africa by Kenya we still have issues. The same thing happens to Zimbabwe. Some of the chaos that is happening in Zimbabwe and even in South Africa, most of these are colonial uh, uh, issues. And they are still holding us into poor health, inequalities and poverty. So these are some of the things that we'll, we'll start focusing on once the narrative changes. 
from charity, someone doing us charity to asking to do, to discussing deeper things, reparations, or probably collaborations, or equalization fund, or something along those lines. But I think the language uh, is, is one part of it. It's not the whole of it. It's just one element into this whole conversation. I just wanted to make that um, uh, uh, you know, input eh, into the conversation. But uh, thanks, everyone. It's, it's, it's fun. I've been uh, listening, and it's going well. Back to okay, you, thank Akan. You. <laughs> thank you, Aminu. Uh, we now go back to Prof. Prof. Uh, Adenige, she has something to say. Please let us, uh, Prof. Please go ahead, give your input, or ask your question. Hello, Prof. Hello, Prof. Is her audio working now? I can see. Yeah, she 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 chatted us up that she has something to say. Okay. Hello, Prof. Okay, without much ado, we've uh, spent uh, enough time discussing on this issue. Like Madame Lizzie said, it is a continuous process. We'll be having more, more webinars on this and see how to just collaborate and see what we can do to change the narrative. This is just the beginning in Africa. There are many more to come from other part of Africa as we, we progress so far. But so far so well, we've learned uh, so much today. And uh, we really learned that we want to see how to uh, change the eight narrative. The, the languages that are used that comes with eight is something that we don't like, but because we are the recipient, we are the kind of beggars in court, we just accept it the way it is. And sometimes, sometimes it doesn't go well with us. That's why the accountability aspect comes in. That's why the embezzlement aspect comes in. And also the community, sometimes they reject those things even before the thing starts. So that's where we are right now. And uh, lastly, Ambassador is lifting his hand. Please, let's hear what he has to say before we yeah. now hand over. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I want to appreciate Hanimu for raising this issue of African uh, economic integration. Um, there, is, uh, there is something of great concern that happened when, when we were trying to have a common currency in West Africa, we were almost about adopting the eco, eco currency. And, and something happened. Then the francophone pulled out. And you, you, you know, that, that, that common currency would have aided trade and industry. It would have further cemented the growth of at least the West African sovereignty. And that, that is a very good economic block. So the, the challenge in the discussion that we need to overcome is how can we break the colonial barrier? How can we break that barrier of Anglophone, Francophone, uh, this other block, uh, Portuguese, you know, uh, Espanol, um, all, all those blocks. We have to find a solution to that. And then in, in North Africa, you have the Arabs. So all of them have their own legacy. Some of them were, 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 were um, Anglophone, some were, were French countries, some, you know. So the, I think the biggest obstacle to, to African economic uh, emancipation is for us to find a solution to, to, to break free from that stronghold so that we would be able to think, free our minds and think in the best interest of Africa. Otherwise, uh, you, you would still see people from all parts of the all parts of the world, you know, um, stultifying uh, progress. And uh, the the earlier the earlier our, our colonial I don't want to say colonial myself our, our partners the earlier they realize that our our continuous progress is in their own interest, the better for all of us. So that is just the, 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 the addition that I want to, I want, I want the, the uh, Kampala initiative. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Prof, Prof uh, Anna, you were lifting your hand. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say something to that. You know, the, um, thank you, Ambassador, for bringing up that issue about uh, the common currency for ECOWAS. 
that was an opportunity for all of us um, in um, West Africa to, you know, step afraid, go on to the trajectory for economic development. But then France came in, as you rightly said, and divided the Francophone and the Anglophone opinions. But we have an African Union where our leaders sit. This is why I keep heaping on the point of the political will, internal political will. These people, call them what name you want to call them, but let me call them donor partners or donor countries. They have their interests. And the interest is to continue to harvest what they have been harvesting from Africa. So we need to look inwards. That's why what I mean, uh, Amiri was saying makes a lot of sense. We need to look inwards. What is it that stops African Union, the former Organization for African Unity and all of that? What is it that stops them? Why is it that they have a policy and the people that they got independence from almost 70 years ago come in and divide them. And by the way, this is why the slave trade lasted for as long as it lasted. Because they had people who were colluding with the slave masters within the African community. And that's prolonged it. Yes, eventually the solution came from the slave masters when they, their governments took them on. But the way the world is today, if we just wait for these donor countries to change their habits, it's not going to happen. We, we are going to, we need to look within ourselves and ask ourselves questions. Why can't our leaders see what we are seeing? So that when they come bringing in all the colonial ideas or whatever, they listen to their people. The Francophone people, leaders, should be able to listen to the Francophone population. The Anglophone Africans should be able to listen to the Anglophone population of Africa and give us what we want until they are able to challenge and say to the donor countries, no, we're not going that route again. It's not going to change. If we're going to wait for the donor countries the colonialists to change their ways will wait for a very long time. This is the input I want to make there. The answer has to come from within Africa. Thank you. Oh, wow. OK, thank you, Prof. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, we have Professor Abdeni Gay. Yes. Hey, Finally. Finally. <laughs> Finally. I'm back on my phone. Finally. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've listened, I've listened so intently to all that you have said. And honestly, I, I, I associate myself with all of the, of, with everything, particularly with Professor Anna's comments, who says that we have to look at ourselves first. We must examine how we are dealing with our own problems. I said before that we, got our independence in 1960. 1960 till now is what? You, you, you all know that it's over, over 60 years ago that we got our independence and what have we done? Okay, maybe we were brainwashed that you know we had to get um, the, the permission of, uh, of um, the developed countries or we have to align ourselves with developed countries and all that before we could do well for our own country. But we have had enough opportunities to re-examine our own position. Whether we like it or not, we are in the global market. And I am saying that unless we have, we use an economical eye or an economic eye to look at what is happening in the world today and see how we can uh, position ourselves we will be doing ourselves a lot of damage. I mentioned before that, you know, we have oil, but our oil is not giving us any money. Look, we, you know, if only we can sell what we have at the market price, we will have enough resources. 
we have enough in the economies to tell us how to do this. I, I have really fallen in love with economics because I think it is one thing, one major discipline that is lacking in our own um, training. Economics of power, economics, M Martin was telling us now that there's a power differential, yes. But what created that power differential? It is economics, wealth. So, and, and we are also lucky that we have gotten uh, in power today at the global level, two Nigerians, the, w uh, the WTO and the ADB. They are actually formulating global policies. Why are we not finding out from them how Nigeria can come up and, and benefit from these global markets? I remember that um, our WTO lady said the other day that we were our own um, products that too, they, they are being produced at too high a price. And so, you know, we are not going to get the right money for it. You know, these are the problems that we have. But our government is not looking at that. They are looking at, okay, we've got this money. How is it going to be shared? I, I honestly think that we need to look to um, call upon the community more, upon the youth, upon the, those at the grassroots level, let them know the facts and let them help us to tell the government that we are not delivering. We are supposed to have a social contract with them, but we are not delivering to them. Having said that, yes, the developed countries, they have their own um, self-interest, vested interest in their, in their government, in their countries. Well, why shouldn't they? Why shouldn't they? But it is up to us to make sure that we call them out and we let them know that whatever uh, funds we have, we are, going, we are trying to utilize them judiciously. Thank you very much. I, I think um, you, that was exactly what you all have all said. So I'm not going to sp and spend a lot more time talking about it. Thank you. It's um, okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, you know, <laughs> thank you for allowing me <laughs> to <laughs> ventilate thank, my anger. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, bro. Thank you so much, bro. <laughs> I think we'll be having a frequent uh, engagement based on this. And uh, at this point in time, I think we've spent so much time. So I'll hand over to Malizi to continue so that we can call it a day. Thank you, everybody.